Hello, my name is Lisa Shea, and I'm proud to be part of the 2020 ValleyCast Art and Music Makers Festival. Today we're going to enjoy the wonderful world of cyanotypes. This is a historic form of photography around since the middle 1800s. So I'm going to talk first briefly about the history of cyanotypes, and then we're going to get into some cyanotype making. So let's get started. Cyanotypes is associated with Anna Atkins, who was born in 1799. She waited until 26 to get married so that she could marry someone who supported her scientific and research dreams. Some of their friends included William Henry Fox Talbot, who in 1835 invented the first photography paper. By 1841, Talbot had got some of his first cameras out, and Anna got one of the very first cameras ever in existence to play with, and she was delighted. One of their other friends in 1842 was Sir John Herschel, and he came up with the cyanotype process, which was exactly what Anna needed for her research. So what cyanotype was, was a 8.1% mixture of potassium ferrocyanide, which you see here, and then a 20% <laughs> mixture of ferric ammonium citrate, which is this one here. When you mix those two chemicals together, you end up with something which is light reactive. So what Anna would do was paint this onto a piece of paper and then lay her algae on top of it, and then after exposing it for about 10 minutes, now she had a perfect image of the algae, which she could then put into a book. She was the first person ever to make a photography book that showed actual representations of images. And when you think about books before this, if they wanted to show something like birds or landscapes, someone had to draw them. You had to get someone to draw the birds or paint the birds or draw the landscapes, and it was always an artist's interpretation. You never saw the actual details of the object in question. This was the first time ever with cyanotypes that you got an actual perfect representation of the object, in this case, the algae. And you could see all the little details of the algae in perfect um, proportions. And then also at the bottom, you can see that this is her handwriting. So what she did for this is she took a very thin piece of paper and cut it into a little shape. And then by hand, with black ink, she wrote on the words. And by laying that on top of her cyanotype paper, along with the piece of algae, the sun shone through the thin paper and was blocked by the ink, and now she could add words to her document. So Anna made an entire book this way, page by page, laying algae onto a blank sheet of paper that she had painted with the cyanotype liquid, writing a little label onto very thin paper, and laying it down. So when she was done with this process, she made a book, and then she started over again with fresh pieces of algae and fresh pieces of paper, and she made a second book. So she made a couple of copies of this book, and it was the first ever book done with the photography process. So here's one of her plates that she used to, to describe what the book was about. And again, she did this by handwriting on very thin paper her words in black ink and laying them down and then exposing them to the sun. And the sun turned everything that touched blue and everything else that was blocked from the sun stayed white, the natural color of the paper. So this was an amazing thing. People were just uh, very impressed that you could do this, perfectly represent anything that you could draw onto thin paper because the black of the ink would block the sun. So this came out, it was world changing, and architects suddenly realized that they could make perfect copies of their architectural drawings by drawing their architectural drawings on thin paper, drawing it with thick dark ink, and then laying it on a piece of paper that had been treated with the cyanotype liquid on it. So when they laid their paper down, the sun would shine through, it would turn the paper blue, and it would not expose anywhere where the architect had drawn their drawing plans. And that is why we have blueprints. So an architect would have drawn all these plans, the, the white lines, in black ink. They would lay their thin sheet of paper down on the cyanotype paper. The sun would shine through the thin areas, turning the cyanotype paper blue. The dark areas with the ink would have stayed white. And now they were had a way to perfectly replicate their architectural drawing over and over again for the masons and bricklayers and everyone else associated. This was the first time that architects were able to distribute out their plans in exact duplicates. And everyone thought it was the most amazing thing ever. So Anna really made a big difference in the world. So here's an example of how it works. This is a t-shirt and I painted this area here with the cyanotype liquid. And you can see that it's starting to turn blue under the sun. I put down bicycle gears, and then also this is a piece of transparency. So this black ink is going to block the sun from reaching the t-shirt or the chemicals, and these clear areas are going to let the sun through. So the sun will shine right through this and be able to get to the paint and turn it blue. 
So there is an end result. So you can see that the sun, everywhere the sun touched, whether it was just bare fabric or here through the transparency, turns blue. Everywhere that the sun was blocked by the gears or by the ink in here stays white. So this becomes an amazing way to do all sorts of different kind of artwork. And it served all sorts of practical purposes back in the day before Xerox machines and digital printers and all of those sorts of things. So that's the history of cyanotypes and how it got to be known throughout the world, primarily through architectural drawings and blueprints. So let's talk now about how to actually make a cyanotype in modern times and what kinds of things you can do with it. The first step involved in making a cyanotype is to mix together the two source chemicals. So we start with the ferric ammonium citrate and the potassium ferrous cyanide. So you can see the citrate is green and the ferrous cyanide is orangey. So each of them gets mixed with just regular old water to make a mixture of the chemical plus water. So this container here has the ferric ammonium citrate. It's just, just water and the green stuff in here. And this bottle here has the potassium ferrous cyanide. So it's just this orange stuff with some water in here. So these two containers can stay for years and years. And it's just a swishy liquid in there. So water plus the green stuff, swishy liquid, water plus the orange stuff. So the special magic happens when you mix the two of those together. And when you mix the two of those together, that becomes the actual cyanotype liquid and it is ready to go. Now websites will tell you that this stuff, once it's mixed together, only lasts for two to four hours before it loses its potency. But I've had this stuff sitting around for months and months and it still works fine. So you don't have to go too crazy about using it all up and mixing it up as you go. These two things here definitely last for years and years. So you can get yourself a batch of the green stuff, a batch of the orange stuff, and then mix them together whenever you're ready to go. And now you've got the cyanotype paint to take your next step with. All right, so now we have the finished cyanotype liquid, which again is the mixture of those two different chemicals we talked about before. So once those two are mixed together, this is in an active state and ready to go. This is reactive to light. So you want to do all of this at night when the sun is not shining because if the sun contacts this liquid, it's going to start to turn it blue. And you don't want anything to happen until you're ready. So this is in a light-proof container so that keeps it safe. And we are doing this at night so all of this painting and stuff that we do does not get exposed to the sun. So I have special mixing cups and stuff that I've labeled that it's only for cyanotype stuff. Those little spray bottles over there only for cyanotype stuff, and we will pour in some. So these are just pieces of watercolor paper. The reason I like to use watercolor paper is the ending part of this process is going to be to rinse them with water, and if we use just regular printer paper, the act of rinsing them with water is going to make it all wiggly and not great to use. So watercolor paper does very well handling with water. So one thing that we can do is just brush this on and cover the whole thing. Alright, so if we let that dry, then in the morning we could make, you know, we could put a leaf on there, or we could put a bicycle gear or something else like that and have the reaction happen. So you can certainly paint the entire piece just solid like that. One idea that you could do is sort of dab it on and have little white spots. And now in the day when we expose this and put a leaf on it or whatever else we choose to put on it, there's going to be these little splotches in there. So that could create a fun effect. And here I will let some of the drip back off in there. You know what I'm doing this on cardboard? This stuff is really stainy, so if you did it on the white counter, you'd have to scrub it off afterwards. So you want enough on there so that when you put an object on there, you can actually see where the shadow of the object falls, because if there isn't enough dark areas in here, you won't be able to see the shape of the gear or leaf or fern or whatever it is that you're working with. You can do all sorts of things. You can do swirly things. So 
sometimes I like to do something like this where it's mostly coated but you have rough edges coming off the end with the brush strokes So once you get everything painted, and you, again, you do this all in the dark, because if you were doing this and there was sunlight, this would start turning right away, and that would uh, <laughs> you know, sort of go against the purpose of doing this and then being able to put objects on top of it to be able to expose them. So now the tricky part is that you want these to dry in general before you go out and expose them tomorrow. So you need to store these somewhere where the light's not going to hit them before you get a chance to get to them. So what some people do is have these light proof bags that they sell for like photography and stuff so you can slide them into here. Uh, I'd wait until they dry a little first before you put them in. <laughs> but then you can put them inside here to be able to keep them uh, completely protected from the light until you're ready to use them. So as you can see, cyanotypes can be made from all sorts of different kinds of objects. The top left and the top right were made from bicycle gears. The second from the left was made from an old leaf. The centermost on the top is done from a metallic headdress, a chain, chain metal headdress like the kind from King Richard's Fair. On the bottom row, the left hand one is a bunch of uh, guitar parts, vacuum tubes from the amplifier, guitar picks, and strings. The second one over is a wildflower. 
The third one over was done with large format negatives from my old style film camera along with some forget-me-not flowers. And then the far right hand one is a tavern puzzle, the kind of metal puzzles that you try to take apart. So anything that casts a shadow and that can sit still for a few minutes can be used to create a cyanotype. So thank you for enjoying this travel of cyanotype exploration with me and I hope that you get out there and try making some cyanotypes of your own. Thank you again to the Valleycast Art and Music Festival for having me be a part of this.